All right, Chemistry 1401. This is the practice final exam, the 16th question. We already did the first 15 questions in our last video. So let's get to it. Question 16, an atom of iron has two 4s electrons. So that means it's going to be 4s2 and six 3d electrons. So that's three 3d6, okay? How many unpaired electrons would there be in the iron two plus ion? So if we write out the electron configuration for iron, which they've already given to us, but the noble gas that precedes iron is argon. And so we put that in these square brackets that deals with all of our core electrons. And then we put four S two, three D six. Well, if we want to make iron two plus, that means we're going to have to lose two electrons, right? We're going to minus two electrons. They're going away. Well, you might remember a rule that I mentioned briefly in a lecture one time called the first in and first out rule, right? If we were, you know, adding electrons to the fourth period, they would go into the 4s orbital first, and then they go into the 3d orbital after that. So you'd go 4s1, 4s2, 3d1, 3d2, 3d3, so on and so forth. But when we're removing electrons, you know, where are we going to take those two electrons from? Well, we're actually going to take them from the orbital that has the highest principal quantum number. And so we will take them from the 4s orbital, which means that our electron configuration would simply be 3d6. Now, if I write out my five 3d orbitals, so these are my 3d orbitals, I'm going to have one, two, three, four, five, six. And I put those in there according to Hunt's rule, right? The bus rule that you fill up all orbitals until they're half full, then you start pairing up electrons. Well, the question asks us how many electrons are unpaired, right? How many unpaired electrons? And we have one, two, three, four electrons in d orbitals that are unpaired. Question 17 deals with the um, hydrogen atom. Which emission line in the hydrogen spectrum occurs at the highest frequency? So we're looking for the highest frequency, and we know that energy is directly proportional to frequency because energy is equal to Planck's constant times nu, which is frequency, right? Here we have energy, energy, and this is just review for everybody, and this here is frequency, okay? Therefore, energy and frequency are proportional. So we're looking for the highest energy transition here. And it's also telling us that it is emission. Now, if it's emission, that means we're going from a high, right? We're going from high to low, okay? So we're going from a high to a low number. And so if we look at these two possibilities here, n is equal to four to n is equal to two, and n is equal to three to n is equal to one, right? These are both emission. And let me see, emission, okay? If I go from a low to a high, as is shown in the bottom two. So, um, sorry, not in, I misspoke. There we go. Um, sorry, I th I'm getting mixed up with another question, I guess. Okay, these are all emission. Okay, Mr. Dion's got another question on the brain here. Anyhow, all of these are going from a high, um, uh, a high end to a lower end. So these are all emission. Okay, so we can't eliminate any that way. But if you remember the relative energies of the, um, of the levels, okay, of the energy level. So the relative heights of the energy level. So if we go from an n is equal to one, so if we have an n is equal to one up to an n is equal to two, right? Then they start to get closer together when you have an n is equal to three, and then they get even closer together when you have an n is equal to four, and they get even closer together when you have an n is equal to five, like that, and so on and so forth. And so the energy difference between two consecutive orbits decreases as n increases. And we could write that in here. Um, um, energy, we'll put here energy difference. What's the easiest way to phrase this? Energy di difference between two consecutive, uh, between, between two orbits, okay, decreases, decreases as n increases, right? And that is manifested in the Rydberg equation where the delta E or the difference in energy is equal to the um, a Rydberg constant. So that's negative 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 joules um, multiplied by one over um,
n low squared. Sorry, n um, uh, n final squared. Sorry, I'm thinking of another thing here. One over n initial squared, like that. And so the the term that's in here is going to um, dictate the difference in the energy levels, right? So if we're dividing by big numbers, then we're going to have smaller numbers in here. And so the the smaller the number, right? The smaller the denominator is, the larger the, the factor is going to be. And so the um, based off of that, the energy difference between two consecutive orbits decreases as n increases. The emission that's going to occur at the highest energy or the highest frequency is going to be that n is equal to 3 to n is equal to 1, right? And you can see it clearly if I draw it like this, n is equal to 3, n is equal to 1, right? The delta E associated with this, for example, is a lot bigger than the one from, let's say, 4 to 2, right? It might not be easy to tell in my, um, you know, mine, which isn't to scale here. But anyhow, uh, hopefully it makes, uh, hopefully you can clearly see it. All right, let's move on to number 18, molecular geometry, my favorite subject. Which of the following molecules is planar? You know, by now you should be able to draw some of these molecular geometries off by heart, right? So if we draw ammonia and we draw its um, molecular geometry, it is trigonal, trigonal pyramidal, trigonal pyramidal. If we draw carbon tetrachloride, right, carbon tetrachloride, that's carbon with four bonds to chlorine. And so that is a tetrahedral molecule. It's a non nonpolar molecule, even though it's got polar bonds in it. All right, so this is tetra tetrahedral. If we draw um, SO32 minus, so that's the sulfite ion, we could practice that one. Sulfur has six valence electrons, oxygen has six times three, and then we add two for the negative charge. So that's 18 plus 6 is 24, 25, 26. So we've got 26 valence electrons like that. If we start drawing our sulfur and we put a bond to each of the oxygens like this, if you fill them one, two, three, four, five, six, one, there we go. Fill up the octets of all the oxygens like that. Now I've used up eight times three, which is 24. So I put 25, 26 like this. Um, the way that it's written here, I have three bonds in a lone pair of my sulfur, so it would have um, it would have a um, positive charge, but I can eliminate that positive charge if I take one of those pairs of electrons and make a double bond like that. Okay, now I've got a negative charge on this oxygen and this oxygen. What's my conclusion is that I have one, two, three, four regions of electron density surrounding my sulfite ion. And one of them is a lone pair. And so this would also be trigonal, trigonal pyramidal, pyramidal, like that. Okay. Um, if we look at the last one, though, the last one is the carbonate ion. Well, if I draw the Lewis structure of the carbonate ion, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it um, because we've already looked at this polyatomic ion when we practiced our resonance structures back in the day. Well, you can see that the carbon in carbonate has three regions of electron density. Remember that in a region of electron density, right, a red can be a single bond, a double bond, a triple bond. It can be a lone pair or a radical. And so we have a double bond and two single bonds. So that means three regions of electron density. And therefore, the molecular geometry of the carbon in carbonate is going to be trigonal, trigonal planar. And so this is a flat molecule when none of the other molecules are flat. They're either trigonal pyramidal or tetrahedral for carbon tetrachloride. Let's move on and tackle another one that deals with Lewis structures and molecular geometry. This one here just plain old asks you, you know, what's the shape of this molecule? We have bromine pentafluoride. Well, let's tally up the total number of electrons, right? We know that bromine is a halogen and fluorine is a halogen so they both both elements have seven valence electrons that's seven times i have five plus one so that's a total of six so seven times six gives me 42 valence electrons well one of the rules that i've gone over with you several times this semester is that fluorine always has one bond and three lone pairs that's your only possibility for fluorine you can't do anything else with the fluorine therefore our bromine must be the central atom and then we're just going to draw one, two, three, um, four, 
five bonds to fluorine. And then why don't we fill up the octets of all the fluorines as well? And then we'll tally up eight times five. Um, right. And if you're wondering, where are you getting the eight times five? Right. Right here, I have eight. Right. Three lone pairs in a bond. That's eight electrons. And I have that five times. So eight times five, that means I've used up 40 electrons. So subtract 40 electrons. That gives me two left over. Where are they going to go? Well, fluorine can't take any more. Fluorine is in the second period. It cannot exceed its octet rule. And so we're going to put a lone pair here like that. That means that the bromine has six regions of electron density, right? Its electron geometry would be octahedral. But let's draw out its molecular geometry, right? I'm going to have the bromine in the center. I'm going to have four fluorines in a plane like this, okay? And I'm leaving out my lone. Then I'm going to have one going up like this. Let's fill in the lone pairs, all right? Like that. And then I'm going to have one pointing down like that. And so the molecular geometry or the shape is square, square pyramidal. Sometimes you'll hear this called square-based pyramidal, but it says right here, square pyramidal. Well, the question that's being asked, you know, is how would I know what they're asking for here? They're asking you for the shape, right? Electrons are never considered in a shape, okay? A shape only is only considered, is only considers bonds. Okay, so that's how you would know that. Let's move on to question number 20. This is kind of a goofy question. I call this a, you know, a, a, it's not the perfect question. It's, it's okay. It says, which type of hybrid orbital is used in carbon dioxide? I'd say there's two answers to this one. I don't like questions like this, and I promise there won't be any questions like this on your actual exam, right? But if you draw the Lewis structure for carbon dioxide, you see that the carbon has two regions, oops, two regions of electron density, doesn't it? If it's got two regions of electron density, that means it's SP hybridized, okay? So the answer is SP, and if you do the practice exam, on Canvas and you type in or you press or select SP, it'll grade the question correct. But that's technically not the only hybrid orbital that's used in carbon dioxide. It's the hybrid orbital used in, in carbon, but what about the oxygens? Those are hybridized as well, aren't they? Because the oxygens have a double bond in two lone pairs. And so the oxygens are SP2 hybridized. Anyhow, in the question, they're referring to only the central atom or you have to assume that. All right, let's move on from there. Question 21 it says, knowing that fluorine is more electronegative than either boron or phosphorus, what conclusions can be drawn from the fact that boron trifluoride has no dipole moment, but phosphorus trifluoride does have a dipole moment? Well, if you remember BF3, that's a specific example that we looked at, right? We looked at how boron does not have a complete octet. Boron is in group 3A. Boron only has three valence electrons, and so boron only forms three bonds. If we draw the Lewis structure in the molecular geometry of BF3, we see that boron is surrounded by three regions of electron density, right? They're all going to get as far away from each other as possible, and so the bond angles will be 120 degrees, which means the molecule is trigonal, trigonal planar, right? Now, that explains why boron trifluoride doesn't have a dipole. There's a polar bond here, there's another polar bond here, and there's a polar bond here. But the dipoles, dipoles cancel, don't they? Right, because they're all got pulling in equal and opposite directions. Whereas if I look at phosphorus trifluoride, PF3, well, phosphorus trifluoride, the phosphorus has a lone pair, right? Phosphorus is in group 5A. So when I draw out its you know, molecular geometry, you can see that I have three polar bonds, right? The phosphorus fluorine bonds are all polar, but they're not canceling each other out, are they? They're all pulling down in this, you know, outward, outwardly from a pyramid. And so the resultant dipole or the net dipole, and I don't have a lot of space here, is going to be pulling down like that from the phosphorus. And so that explains why phosphorus trifluoride is a polar molecule. Now, I didn't even look at the answers yet. But these are things that you should be able to come up with on your own before you even look at the, at the um, answers. Now, of course, if you want to read them first, be my guest. 
All right, let's take a look here. It says the boron trifluoride molecule must be linear. No, that's not true. Boron trifluoride is trigonal planar. Boron trifluoride is not spherically symmetrical, but phosphorus trifluoride is. Well, boron trifluoride isn't spherically symmetrical, but boron trifluoride, or sorry, phosphorus trifluoride isn't either, okay, or is not. So that's not a correct answer. Now, the next one, it says the boron trifluoride molecule is trigonal planar, right? That makes sense, right? BF3 is trigonal planar, whereas phosphorus trifluoride isn't. And the last one is the atomic radius of phosphorus is larger than the atomic radius of boron. Well, the size of the atomic radii have nothing to do about, you know, whether or not dipoles are going to cancel so that you end up with a nonpolar molecule. All right, let's move on from there. Question 22. How many valence electrons are represented in sulfur dioxide in the Lewis electron dot structure of sulfur dioxide? Well, we've done this many, many times over the course of chemistry 1401. Sulfur is in group 6A. Oxygen is in group 6A. Sulfur has six valence electrons. Oxygen has six valence electrons. There's one sulfur. There's two oxygens. That gives me six and 12. And when I tally up six and 12, I get 18 total valence electrons. All right. And since sulfur is in the third period, it can expand its octet, can't it? So if we draw the Lewis structure of sulfur dioxide, which we did, over the course of chemistry 1401, it looks like this, right? Sulfur dioxide is has a bent molecular geometry. Now that's not what they're asking for, but it's always fun to review things like that, those kind of concepts. Question 23, the boiling point of water uh, compared to similar molecules can be explained by, if you look at all these hydrides, right? If you look at um, sulfur hydride, selenium hydride, tellurium hydride, and you see, as we go, you know, in this direction, we see the boiling point is increasing. So technically, you know, water, if, you know, just follow that trend, water should have a boiling point, you know, less than 61, negative 61 degrees Celsius. Wow, that's super cold. But it actually has a really high boiling point. So it's a huge anomaly. And we went over that anomaly when we looked at, you know, periodic trends. Can anybody tell me um, which one of these is responsible for the high boiling point of water? And it's not a trick question. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Joel. The answer is hydrogen bonding, right? If we look at these um, different forces here, we have nonpolar covalent bonding. Well, nonpolar covalent bonding, that's a type of intra, intramolecular force. Intramolecular force. Intramolecular forces have nothing to do with boiling points, do they? In a covalent molecule, have nothing to do with that, okay? So the intramolecular forces are nonpolar covalent bonding. That would be something like, you know, the bond in, in Br2, right? The bond, This bond has nothing to do with a boiling point, okay? Nothing, not even on the same radar. If I look at these last three, though, I have dipole, induced dipole forces. Well, that is a type of intermolecular force between a molecule that has a permanent dipole and a molecule that doesn't have a permanent dipole. Um, but that's not going to be experienced between two different molecules of, of water, is it? Hydrogen bonding will be maximized between two water molecules. That's what Sierra wrote in the chat, right? She said, okay, well, if I have water, it's got two lone pairs, two hydrogen bond donors, or sorry, two hydrogen bond acceptors and two hydrogens, which means two hydrogen bond um, acceptors. Anyhow, I'm probably thinking too much here. All right, so we have our delta minus and our delta plus, our delta plus and our delta minus like that. Anyhow, just showing some hydrogen bonding. Anyhow, I'm pretty sure that's a question that most of my students are confident in. All right, if you have a calculator, make sure to grab it. I got one here on my desk. Get situated here. I like to double check my calculations. I do them before the Oftentimes I do them before the lecture, but you always want to check yourself. Okay, it says a 4.08 uh, gram sample of a compound of nitrogen and oxygen. So this is some kind of compound that contains nitrogen and oxygen, contains 3.02 grams of oxygen. What's the empirical formula? And we have some empirical formulas here. Well, we need to find out the molar ratio of nitrogen to oxygen, right? That's all we have to do to determine an empirical formula. And if we have a total 
mass of 4.08 grams and we've got 3.02 grams of oxygen, then the mass of nitrogen is going to be equal to 4.08 grams subtract 3.02 grams like that. That gives you 1.06 grams of nitrogen. Okay, so why don't we figure out the number of moles of nitrogen and the number of moles of oxygen, and then we'll compare them and determine our empirical formula. So let's start with nitrogen. I have 1.06 grams of nitrogen. I go to the periodic table. I see the molar mass of nitrogen is 14.01 grams per mole, like that. Grams cancel out. I'm left over with the number of moles, um, which is, let me see here. Where did I go? Mm, Mr. Dion's all over the place here, isn't he? Let's see. Where was I? Here we go. Okay, getting my calculator. So 1.06 divided by 14.01. There we go. All right, so it gives you 0 0.0757 moles of nitrogen. We're going to do the exact same exercise for our oxygen. We have 3.02 grams of oxygen. Oxygen weighs 16.00 grams per mole. Okay, double check our units of mass. There we go. Everything looks good. And I end up with 0 0.189 moles. Now, we can't have a formula like this, right? It would be funny, but we can't have N 0 0.75, 0 0.757, oh, you know, 0 0.189. There's no such thing as that, right? So what are we going to do? We're going to divide both of these by the smallest number of moles. So we're going to divide this one by itself, 0 0.757 moles. And then that's going to give us one. And we're going to divide this by 0 0.0757 moles. So 0.189 divided by 0 0.0757. That gives us almost 2.5. So pretty dang close to 2.5. There we go. Now, again, there's no such thing as NO2.5. That doesn't exist. But if we multiply this whole thing because... 2.5 is the same thing as 5 over 2. If we multiply all this by 2, then we get what? We get N2O5 because in empirical formula, the subscripts have to be whole numbers. And so the empirical formula is dinitrogen pentoxide. All right, give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that one. Somebody's asking me, where did I get the 1.06 grams of nitrogen? The answer is this. The total mass, right? They're saying that you have a 4.08 gram sample and it contains both nitrogen and oxygen and it has 3.02 grams of oxygen. So the 1.06 grams that came from right here, okay? It's just the remainder of the mass. Whatever's not oxygen has to be nitrogen. Does that help? Okay. Let's move on. The question, um, couldn't you round the 2.5 to 2? Absolutely not. No, no way. Because you've got three sig figs here. I could have even used more sig figs. Okay. If you were to round that to 2, you're taking, a, you know, you're rounding way too many digits off. Okay. The 0.189 divided by, so the 0.189 divided by 0.0757, it's, it's 2.497. So 2 point, you know. Two, so that gives you two point, um, so look, it's 2.497. We can only have three sig figs, right? This would be 1.00, and this actually rounds to 2.50, okay? So no, you can't start messing around and doing rounding like that, okay? Sig figs do count. All right, question 25. What mass of carbon is present in half a mole of sucrose? And it gives us the molar mass. Sucrose is table sugar. So so one time I had a student think that, you know, tell me that glucose was table sugar. No, no, no. Glucose is, um, is in sucrose. Sucrose contains two monosaccharides, uh, fructose and glucose. So sucrose is actually uh, a disaccharide made from two monosaccharides. Anyhow, so this is table sugar, table sugar, okay? And if you Google table sugar and you look at the actual... IUPAC name. I can never remember what it is. It's really long. Anyhow, there we go. So we have half a mole of sucrose. So let's do some dimensional analysis here because we want to figure out the mass of carbon. We got half a mole of sucrose. And let's see here. 
Um, we know that in one mole of sucrose, we've got um, 12 moles of carbon, don't we? 12 moles of carbon. And we know that one mole of carbon from the periodic table has a mass of 12.01 grams of carbon. Look, my moles of sucrose cancel out, my moles of carbon cancel out, and I'm left over with the mass of carbon. So I take 0.5. Multiply by 12, so that's 6 times 12.01, and that gives me 72.1 72 grams of carbon. This is one of those examples where, you know, they give you some information that's not required, right? You don't need the molar mass of sucrose, not required for anything. And if you're wondering, you know, are you going to do that? Uh, it's possible. I don't have every question memorized. But um, I would say there's a possibility there of giving you information. Think about it. Any problem that you do in chemistry, you have thousands and thousands of bits of information that you don't need. You just have to be able to interpret it. Right? If I ask you a question about sucrose, you still have the entire periodic table. There's all kinds of information on there that you're not using. So being able to de decipher and determine what is important and what isn't is, is definitely um definitely has uh, plays an important role in learning and chemistry. Okay, question 26, moving right along. This question could be solved one of two ways, okay? You could solve this question using just hardcore, good old mathematics, you know? Um, or you could kind of solve this conceptually. Let me show you how to solve it conceptually. You're like, I'm not even sure what the question is, Mr. Dion. Let's read it. It says the number of atoms in nine grams of aluminum is the same as the number of atoms in, and then we have all these different masses of magnesium. So we're comparing aluminum and magnesium, right? Well, if we think about the molar mass of aluminum, and I'm looking at my periodic table on the wall, it says that it's 26.98, okay? So it says the molar mass of aluminum Aluminum is 26.98 grams, right? That's pretty close to 27. That's very close to 27 um, grams per mole, roughly, okay? So that means if you have nine grams of aluminum, how much aluminum do you have? Well, if one mole weighs 27 and you've only got nine, you've got about one third of a mole of aluminum, okay? So that's where I'm starting. Now we're comparing it to magnesium, all right? We're going to compare it to magnesium. Well, what's the molar mass of magnesium? Magnesium, if I go over to my periodic table, it's element number 12. It has a molar mass of around 24. So it's 24.30 grams per mole, roughly, okay? Or sorry, that's what it says. So roughly, I was going to say is around 24 grams per mole. And I'm doing what I call just a back of a napkin calculation, right? Just kind of thinking out loud here, just doing some rough math, okay? Um, now, if I had a third of 24, if you had 24, I was going to say 24 beers, I shouldn't say that. If you had 24 cans of Coke, you know, and you, and you drank a third of them, how many would you have, have consumed? And the answer is eight of them. So a third, so one third of a mole of magnesium Right, it's going to be equal to around around eight grams, okay, eight grams, something like that. It should be a little bit more, shouldn't it? Right, because it's twenty four point three zero. So the answer is, you know, eight point one eight point one grams of magnesium. Give me a thumbs up if you follow if you follow me on solving it that way. And if you're like, well, Mr. Dion, come on, you used math, you know, that's that's fine. But give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that rationale. All right, thanks, Liv. Good. Thanks, Megan. Perfect. Okay, so some people are like, yeah, no problem. Now, in the interest of time, I'm not going to solve it using the, what I would call the long way. But the other way to solve this would just be to use plain old dimensional analysis. And say you have 9.0 grams of aluminum, right? And to use the molar mass of aluminum, which is um, 26.98 grams of aluminum in one mole of aluminum, right? And if you do that, you're going to have the number of moles of aluminum, okay? So 9 divided by 
26.98 gives us 0 0.333 moles of aluminum. Now, a mole is a number, right? It's nothing more than a number. And we could take that, you know, we could take that dimensional analysis one step further, couldn't we? Right? We could say that in one mole of aluminum, I have 6.022 times 10 to the 23 atoms of aluminum, right? Then you're getting really down and dirty with it. So multiplied by 6.022 times 10 to the 23, that gives us 2.01 times 10 to the 23 um, atoms of aluminum. So then what you would do is you would take that number of atoms, right? Because you're talking about the same number of atoms. And you would say, okay, well, if I've got 2.01 times 10 to the 23 atoms of magnesium, and I know that I have 6.022 times 10 to the 23 atoms, atoms of magnesium in one mole of magnesium, and I know that one mole of magnesium has a mass of 24.30 grams of magnesium. Look. If you take that number divided by 6.022 times 10 to the 23, okay, multiplied by 24.3, you end up with 8.1 grams. Okay, so 8. Point, um, yeah, it's 8.1 grams because you should only have uh, two sig figs. 8.1 grams of magnesium. And if you're like Mr. Dion, all you did was you know multiply the molar mass of magnesium by a third. You know, you did the exact same thing. It's true. Okay. The, all of this that's being done here is the exact same thing that I did here. It's just, you know, kind of making it more complicated than it, than it needs to be. Okay. One thing the final exam tries to do is, you know, test your understanding. All right. Anyhow, something to think about there. Uh, let's move on to another question. This is question 27. Remember, there are 400 questions on the exam. Kidding, kidding, kidding. Uh, let's see here. What's this question about? A mixture containing nine moles of fluorine and four moles of sulfur is allowed to react. The, this, this equation represents the reaction that takes place. I have to rewrite all of these. So I have three fluorines plus sulfur produces sulfur hexafluoride. Um, you're starting it with nine moles of fluorine and four moles of sulfur. And it just says, how many moles of F2 remain after three moles of sulfur have reacted? Look, if initially I start out with, you know, what's written here, nine moles of fluorine, four moles of sulfur. Well, if, you know, if I lose, if three moles of sulfur have reacted, right, that's what I'm drawing in here, okay? Um, we'll call this change. Okay, and then down here, we'll call this final. Maybe I'll use a different color just to make it easier to see. Okay, if I lose three moles of sulfur, how many moles, could anybody do this in their head? How many moles of fluorine would react? And it's not a trick question. Mr. Dion doth not like the trick question. Right. If you lose, if you consume three moles of the sulfur, could anybody tell me how much of the fluorine would be consumed? No, it's not six. All right, it's nine. Okay, and if you need to do it by dimensional analysis, well, then by all means do it, right? Think about it this way. If you have three moles of sulfur reacting, right, and from your balanced equation, you know that for every one mole of sulfur, you're going to consume three moles, oops, three moles of fluorine, F2. Moles of sulfur cancel. You get three times three, which is equal to nine moles of F2, right? That's how much is going to be consumed. So I can plug that in here, nine moles, right? Since the stoichiometric ratio of sulfur to sulfur hexafluoride is one to one, I know that I would also form three moles of sulfur hexafluoride. So finally, how much do you have? You have nine minus nine, right? That gives you no fluorine left over, right? Four minus three gives you one mole of sulfur left over and you would have formed three moles of sulfur hexafluoride. So it's asking you how much fluorine remains when everything is, is done. 
Okay, and you can see that you have zero moles left. Nothing, not a zilch. Okay, and so the answer is all of the fluorine would get consumed in this reaction. It's kind of like a limiting reactant problem. In fact, that's what it is. You know, it's just uh, a simplified version of some of those difficult limiting reactant problems that we looked at where you had to calculate the mass of everything under the sun, you know, and how many moles of everything was, was formed, so on and so forth. All right. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that one, if that helps. Does that help everybody? All right. Good. Thanks, Aurora, Megan. Violet, Joel, Gang, Lindsay, Brianna, Deona, Dehona, Dayona. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, here we go. Let's move on. Number 28. Hey, just a straightforward question about do you understand what the hell happened this semester? <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I'll let you guys read the question. It says, you know, the limiting reagent in a particular reaction can be recognized as the reagent that, we'll put here dot, dot, dot. Can anybody fill this one in for me? You know, it's, it's a short enough answer that you could type it into the chat. What's a limiting reactant? Yeah, so we got uh, Aurora, Autumn, Violet, Lindsay, all correct. You're all 100% correct. It would be used up first, right? That's the definition of a limiting reactant, right? Whatever gets consumed first in the reaction, that's your limiting reactant, right? What was the example that we used? We were making the ice cream sundaes or jeepers, I can't remember. What did we make? Hot dogs or something? We had the buns and the wieners or maybe we made a hamburger or a sandwich. I don't remember. But anyhow, I remember uh, teaching you guys or talking to you about limiting reactants way, ba way back in the day when the weather was a little bit warmer. All right, let's try question 29. It says here, what volume of barium chloride, um, so what volume of 0 0.131 molar barium chloride is require, required to react completely with 42 milliliters of 0.453 molar sodium sulfate given the net, following net ionic equation? Well, they give us this beautiful balanced net ionic equation here, right? I mean, do we really you know, need to go through all this? Uh, I don't know. Let's give it a shot here because you know that barium chloride, right? That's an ionic compound. You know that sodium sulfate, right? That's also an ionic compound. And that's going to do a double displacement reaction to give me barium sulfate. Now they tell us that barium sulfate is a solid. And I'm also going to get sodium chloride. If you don't know by now that sodium chloride is aqueous, uh, I don't know. Anyhow, we got all that spinach. Now we can balance out our equation. So we put a two here in front of our sodium and we're all balanced. So that's our molecular equation. Now, if we want to write out an ionic equation, everything that's aqueous gets broken down into its ions. So let's do that. So we've got our ionic equation. We've got barium two plus aqueous plus two chlorides aqueous plus two sodiums aqueous plus a sulfate aqueous plus oops sorry produces barium sulfate which is a solid plus two sodium ions those are aqueous plus two chloride ions aqueous remember everything that says aqueous gets broken apart into its ions but barium sulfate doesn't get broken down because it's a solid we don't break that apart into its ions and so let's cancel everything that's the same on both sides. So we have two, we have two chlorides, cancel those, and we have two sodiums. And so what's left over? Let's see. We've got our beautiful net ionic equation, barium two plus aqueous plus sulfate, two minus aqueous produces barium sulfate. So everything is perfectly balanced out. So when we see the Ba2 plus, that means the barium chloride, right? When we see the sulfate two minus, that means the sodium sulfate. And so they expect you to be able to interpret that when you read the question. Okay, well, let's see what we got here. What volume of uh, this concentration of barium chloride is required to completely react with this concentration of sodium sulfate? What do we need? We need the number of moles of barium chloride, don't we? Right, because we know that concentration and molarity is equal to the number of moles divided by the volume. We have 
the concentration, we're looking for the volume and we can figure out the number of moles, can't we? Because we can figure out the number of moles of sodium sulfate and we have a beautiful balanced equation. If you're a little unsure about this, let me show you how you would do this, okay? This is where we get to practice our dimensional analysis. We have 42.0 milliliters. Now I'm gonna do one for you here. I'm not gonna convert this into liters. You might be like, why are you not doing that, Mr. Dion? Because it's you know not necessary because all of our answers are in milliliters. So we can leave the original volume of sodium sulfate in milliliters. Just watch, look, I got 42.0 mils of sodium sulfate. I have the concentration of my sodium sulfate is 0 0.453 moles of sodium sulfate per liter. Mm, you know what? I don't want to confuse my students. Maybe I should convert that. I'm backtracking. Okay. So let me let me convert this to, to liters, which I know you're all capable of doing, right? Everybody can divide by a thousand in their head, but maybe I because I'm the instructor and I want my units all to cancel. So 0 0.0420 liters of sodium sulfate. It's something I probably wouldn't do if I was alone, but anyhow, there we go. All right, and we know from our balanced equation that if we have one mole of sodium sulfate reacting, right, that's represented by the sulfate ion shown here in the net ionic equation, it's gonna react with one mole of barium chloride Right, that's represented by the barium two plus ion. So one mole of BaCl2. Look at this, you guys. I've got my volume of sodium sulfate canceling, my, mol my number of moles of sodium sulfate canceling, and I'm left over with the number of moles of barium chloride. When I punch all that spinach into my calculator, this is one I did not do. So 0 0.042 times 0.453. That gives you 0 0.0190 moles of barium chloride. Now I'm gonna borrow this equation right here that I'm circling in green. And I'm gonna rearrange that and solve for volume. Volume is gonna be equal to the number of moles divided by the molarity. I have the number of moles, 0 0.0190 moles of barium chloride divided by my molarity, which is 0 0.131. Um, moles per liter. I'm going to take that whole thing and I'm going to multiply it by a thousand milliliters over a liter like that. So I get 0 0.019 divided by 0 0.131 multiplied by a thousand and I get 145 milliliters. I should only have three sig figs. And there we go. There's my final answer like that. All right. Now, there's another way that I could have done this. I kind of broke it up into two big steps, right? I kind of chose this as step one and this is step two. You could have just done the whole dimensional analysis, just kept on going from here, okay? And either way, either way works perfectly well. All right, number 29, there we go. Question 30, antimony. Antimony reacts with sulfur according to this equation. Let me rewrite it just so I can see it with my own two eyes. So I've got two moles of antimony um, plus three moles of sulfur. Three moles of sulfur produces antimony sulfide, which is a solid. Okay, there we go. Beautiful equation. It's balanced. What's the percent yield for a reaction in which 1.40 grams, oops, where am I? Can you guys still see my screen? Sorry about that. All right, good, perfect. Okay, where was I? Um, what's the percent yield for a reaction in which 1.40 grams of antimony sulfide is obtained and you're starting with 1.73 grams of antimony and we've got excess sulfur. So it's not a limiting reactant problem. We don't have to worry about the sulfur, but we know we're starting it with 1.73 grams of antimony. Well, remember that this 1.40 grams, this is the actual yield, right? It's telling you that you've got, you know, 1.40 grams. It's not, that's, that's the reality, right? And you guys know 
that percent yield, okay, is equal to actual mass, you know, actual mass divided by theoretical, theoretical mass multiplied by 100%, okay? So we've got the actual mass. So we have the 1.40 grams. What we need is the theoretical mass. So what's the maximum amount of antimony sulfide that we can make? Well, I've gone ahead and I've looked up the molar mass of antimony, which is 121, so 121.75 grams of antimony in one mole of antimony. And I know that for every two moles of antimony, I make one mole of antimony sulfide. And I know that in one mole of antimony sulfide, and I've got the molar mass given to me here, it's 339.7 grams of antimony sulfide. Look at that. Let's check our units, grams of antimony, moles of antimony. There we go, this cancels, and I'm left over with the mass of antimony sulfide. And I've done this already. I get 2.41 grams of antimony sulfide, like that. So now I can throw that down into my denominator. So this is my theoretical yield, 2.41 grams. I'm gonna multiply that by 100%, and I've already done that too. And I end up with a, a percent yield of 58.1%, and that should be one of the answers close enough. There we go. All right, give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that one. Make sure you know this formula. Percent yield is equal to actual over theoretical multiplied by 100. It's called reality divided by my dreams multiplied by 100. All right, good. Thanks. Thank you very much. Good. Well, let's move on. Question 31. Um, carbon dioxide in the form of dry ice would be classified as, I'll let you guys think about this one. Who's got an answer? How would you classify carbon dioxide? Is it a metallic solid, molecular solid, polymeric, ionic? Thanks, uh, thanks, Autumn. Yeah, it's molecular. All right, the answer is it is a molecular solid, right? A metallic solid, that would be made from a metal, or a metal, and carbon dioxide is made from non-metals, right? We'll put here both, both non-metals. Um, a polymeric solid, that would be a polymer, and um, carbon dioxide is definitely not a polymer. And an ionic solid, that would be made from a metal and a non-metal. So that's definitely not it, right? Carbon dioxide is just a molecule. There we go. So that's good. Let's move on to 32. Which factor affects the vapor pressure of a liquid? We got, we got atmospheric pressure and volume of a liquid. Remember the vapor pressure, if I have, you know, some kind of open vessel here, probably the easiest way conceptually to think about vapor pressure is you have you know the surface of the liquid and then you have some molecules here and it's the force that they exert you know against their environment this is the um, vapor pressure could anybody tell me you know which one of these is going to most or is going to affect the vapor pressure of a liquid there's one of them that's hopefully pretty obvious if you've ever boiled something before <laughs> yeah Aurora says temperature, definitely, that's certainly going to affect vapor pressure, isn't it? Right? If you think about um, water at room temperature, even here in Colorado Springs, uh, it still takes a long time to evaporate, but if you heat that water up, it's definitely going to boil away faster. And so vapor pressure is affected by temperature. Number 33, ideal gas question. It says, what's the molar mass of an ideal gas? If a 0 0.622 sample of this gas occupies a volume of 300 milliliters and at 35 degrees Celsius and 789 millimeters of mercury. Boy, they couldn't give us anything in the proper units here. Now, we're going to use the formula that you've all got memorized. PV is equal to NRT. We know our temperature, we know our pressure, and we know our volume. 
we know our gas constant. We can solve for the number of moles, and that's good because molar mass is equal um, to the mass in grams divided by the number of moles, grams per mole. And we've already got little m. Little m is equal to 0 0.622 grams, like that. So all we need to do is figure out the number of moles of this gas. And we can rearrange the ideal gas law. M is equal to PV divided by RT. Okay, now the rest is a lot of work converting. Okay, converting um, the pressure, the volume, and the temperature. Let's, let's do it all in the equation here. So pressure is 789 millimeters of mercury. I need to convert that to atmospheres. And I know there are 760 millimeters of mercury in an atmosphere, thanks to Evangelista Torricelli and his experiment down by the seaside. I need to convert my volume into liters. I've got 300 milliliters. That's equal to 0 0.300 liters. Hopefully you can do that in your head by now. Um, my R, my gas constant, is 0 0.08206 liters times atmospheres divided by moles multiplied by Kelvin. And I've got my temperature in degrees Celsius. That's a big no-no when using the ideal gas law. I have to add 273 to that. And when I do that, I get 308. So this is 3, come on, 308 Kelvin. So 308 Kelvin. Let's check our units. Right, millimeters of mercury cancel, as do atmospheres, liters cancel, and Kelvin cancel, and I'm left over with the number of moles. Perfect. When I punch all that spinach into my calculator, I get that the number of moles is equal to 0 0.0123 moles. Now I can take that number and I can plug it up in here in my denominator, can I? Well, let's do that. So we have 0 0.0123 moles. And there we go. Let me get the calculator out. So 0 0.622 divided by 0 0.0123 is 50.6. So we end up with keepers. I'm always off by a decimal point here, and I'm always off by a tenth. Anyhow, 50.5 grams per mole, which is just a difference in. No, sorry, I got 50.6, didn't I? Anyhow, it's close enough. Let's just leave it like that. 50.5 grams per mole. That is our answer for our molar mass. Give me a thumbs up if you can put that one together. Everybody knows how to use the ideal gas equation. Everybody knows how to calculate molar mass. But connecting the two in a problem, I would say that is not, you know, always perfectly clear, right? You have to do some, you know, deciphering here. Like, hmm, what do I do? What am I going to do here? Well, I'm going to have to determine the number of moles of my gas. And then I've got the mass of the gas. And from that, I can determine the molar mass. Wonderful. Good. Um, let's see here. Number 34 deals with concentration. What is the molarity, right? What's the concentration of a solution made by dissolving 8.56 grams of sodium acetate? And they give us the molar mass in water and diluting to 750 milliliters. Well, you know that um, molarity, and we looked at this in the last problem, Molarity, or sorry, we looked at it a couple of problems ago, is equal to the number of moles per liter. All right now, we have the volume, okay? 750 milliliters. Hopefully, you know that that is the same thing as 0 0.7500 liters for sig fig. So we can already plug that in here 0 0.7500 liters. But we're, how are we going to get the number of moles of sodium acetate? Well, the good news is I have the molar mass and I have the mass, don't I? So I could take all of that. I could actually do this in one fell swoop, can't I? Right, because I can just say, well, I've got um, eight, let's see here, 8.56 grams divided by 82.03 grams per mole in my numerator. Grams are going to cancel, and I'm going to be left over with moles per liter. There we go. That's a fast way of doing it. So it's here, 8.56 divided by 82.03. So that's 0.104 um, divided by 0.01. So that gives you 0 0.139 molar. All right. There we go. I think that's a pretty straightforward problem. You know, I don't 
would, would shudder to use the word simple in a chemistry class, but I think that this would be a straightforward problem. Gage, I told you there's a 400 problems on the exam. All right. Well, I'll let you guys take a second to look at question 35. So just take a peek at that and see if you can get started on it. <sighs> All right, so let's see here. Question 35. Um, what volume of 12 molar HCl solution is required to prepare exactly 500 milliliters of a 0.6 molar HCl solution, right? We're going from something concentrated, 12 molar, and we're making something less concentrated. And so this is a dilution problem, dilution. That means we can use the formula M1V1 is equal to M2V2. Right, and we're trying to figure out what volume of this solution will we need. If we call this M1, and we call this M2, and we call this V2, if we solve for V1, we would say that, sorry, V1 is equal to M2 V2 over M1, like that. 0 0.60 molar multiplied by V2, 500 milliliters divided by 12 molar. Our final answer, the V1, V1 rather, should have two sig figs. So if I take points, sorry, 0.3 divided by 12. Uh, no, what am I doing wrong here? Wait, six. Oh, there we go. Uh, there we go, divided by 12. There you go. And you end up with 25 milliliters. Just a straightforward M1V1 is equal to M2V2 problem. Anybody with me on that one? Does everybody follow me on the dilution problem? Even if you're, you know, a chunk of the way there. Great. Thanks, Violet. Thanks, everybody. Great. Perfect. Let's move on. Question 36. Question 36. What's the mole fraction of water in 200 grams of 95% by mass ethanol? This is a solution of ethanol in water, right? And it's 95% by mass ethanol. Remember that percent, you know, mass was mass of solute divided by mass of of solution okay multiplied by 100 percent all right so that means if you have a solution that's 95 percent right if it's come on if it's 95 percent ethanol and i'll abbreviate ethanol is etoh like that if it's 95% ethanol, that means you've got 95 grams of ethanol, right, as your solute, and your sol your solution has got 95 grams of ethanol. And since I'm, I'm, I'm making it up out of 100, right? If it's 95%, 95 divided by 100 multiplied by 100. So that means you'd have 5 grams of water as well. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me thus far, just to where I am. Okay, I'm not even going to use the 200 grams. Okay, not necessary. All right? If it's 95% by mass ethanol, that means in 100 grams, I'd have 95 grams of ethanol and 5 grams of water. Okay, that's all I'm doing so far. Because if I want to figure out the mole fraction, right? If I want to figure out the mole fraction of ethanol, it's going to be equal to the number of moles of ethanol divided by the total number of moles, right? It's going to be equal to the number of moles of ethanol divided by the number of moles of ethanol 
plus the number of moles of water, right? Because that's what the solution is made out of. It's just ethanol and water. There's nothing else in there. Well, I can use this right here, All right? I know the molar mass of ethanol. It's given to me right here. And I know the molar mass of water. It's 18. I got that memorized. You got that in my brain. Okay. Well, how would I figure out the number of moles of ethanol? It would be 95 grams divided by 46 grams per mole, right? Divided by 95 grams over 46 grams per mole plus 5 grams divided by 18.01 grams per mole. Okay, so water is 18.01 grams per mole. Or is it 18.02? Either way, it doesn't matter. 18.02 grams per mole. Okay, so that's that's the answer to the problem, right? Because once you've done what I have written here in black, that'll give you the number of moles of ethanol, which is 0. Um, uh, what is it here? Oh, what am I looking for? Am I looking for the mole fraction of water? Oh, crap. I'm figuring out the mole fraction of ethanol. Whatever. It doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Uh, let's see here. Where was I? So the number of moles of ethanol is what? 2.06. And if you're like, oh, Mr. Dion, you screwed up. No, I didn't. Watch. Uh, 2.06 gram or moles of ethanol. Let me double check my calculations. 95 divided by 46. There we go. Divided by 2.06 moles plus 5 divided by 18.02. 0 0.277 moles. Okay, let's do that. And we get the mole fraction of the ethanol as being 0 0.88. Okay, so I've done the first part. There's the mole fraction of my ethanol. I have a question for you guys. Who can do this in their head? If the mole fraction of ethanol is 0 0.88 and the solution is only made out of ethanol and water, the mole fraction of water? It's not 0.22, it's 0.12, right? 1.00 subtract 0 0.88 gives you 0 0.12, right? That's what's left over. So that's going to be the mole fraction of my water. And there you have it. Done. Okay. You see here, like the only thing that I, there's nothing wrong with what I did. I was just thinking about it in terms of ethanol. If I had set this up, so I determined the number of moles of water divided by the number of moles of water plus, right? then I would have ended up with 0.12. But I just solved it for the mole fraction of ethanol. Either way, neither here nor there. But you see that that answer is up there, so they threw it in there to kind of screw you up, just in case you, you, you didn't think about that last step. Okay, next question deals with colligative properties. What time is it? Uh, 10.34. We got lots of stuff. We got what, two more hours. Let's see here. Uh, you got 800 grams of ethanol. Good. And you add it to 8.0 times 10 to the 3 grams of water. So that's what? That's 8,000 grams of water. Okay, with two sig figs. Um, how much would this lower the freezing point? And it gives you the molal freezing point depression constant for water. Or the freezing point depression constant for water. Uh, well, this is a formula we looked at in class the other day. The delta TF is going to be equal to the freezing point depression constant multiplied by molality. Right, what's molality? It's the number of moles of solute divided by kilograms of solvent, not solution, right? That's something I tried to really stress with you. And here's something I was thinking about this morning. You know, I was looking over what I was going to talk about with you guys, problems we were going to do. And remember, we looked at this at the very end of the last lecture. We said that delta TF is equal to the Van Hoff factor multiplied by KF times um, molality. You remember that? Okay. Well, the I, if I'm dealing with ethanol, right, I is going to be equal to one because ethanol is it's a molecular compound, is a non-electrolyte. Okay. Like, right. When you dissolve ethanol in water, it doesn't break apart into anything. It's still ethanol. It remains intact. So that's why I didn't include the I here. I just left it out. So that means our delta TF 
the amount that our freezing point is going to be lowered is going to be equal to um, 1.86 degrees Celsius per molal multiplied by the molality. So what's the number of moles of solute? Well, I've got 800 grams of my solute, ethanol, right? Oh, I don't need to put the identity. Our solute is ethanol. What's the molar mass of ethanol? Didn't we have that on a previous slide, right? It was 46 grams per mole. Okay, so we'll put that in our numerator and the kilograms of solvent. Well, if you've got this many grams of water, that's going to be equal to 8.0 kilograms of water. So 8.0 kilograms, oops, like that. And so you can see that grams cancel here. I end up with moles per kilogram, which is molality. And then moles per kilogram, we're going to cancel it with the molality there. And so that means my delta TF is going to be equal to, and I've done this one already, it's uh, 4.0 degrees Celsius. So that's how much the freezing point is going to be lowered for that eight kilograms of water when you put 800 grams of ethanol in there. All right. Just going to look through the whole thing here. And so the whole practice exam is a total of 50 questions. And we'll finish the rest of the questions in class on Wednesday. You guys, did I post the solutions to these? I don't think I did. Is that a yay or a nay? I can't remember. Okay, so Aurora says, I don't think so. Let me make a PDF quickly and I'm gonna post it in the chat of the solutions for the rest of the problems, just so my students who come to class can look at them. I'm just scanning them very quickly here and I'll airdrop them. And this is just for the last few questions. One more and I'm done. Just give me one second here. Okay. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Looks good. So other apps. Airdrop. Give me one second, you guys, and I'm going to post the rest of them here. Okay, there we go. So give me one second. Give me two steps, give me two steps, miss. No, give me three steps. Give me three steps, miss. To give me three steps towards your door. Am I recording this? Damn it.